Her talent has been recognized by the Downbeat Critics Poll as the 2020 Up and Coming Saxophonist of the Year. My name is Claudia Morales from the Music Division and I am thrilled to have Lakeisha Benjamin here sitting next to me. Lakeisha, welcome to the library. <laughs> Thanks for having me. We're Thanks so for excited me. to have you here. I'm definitely excited. <laughs> Lakeisha is here for her performance tomorrow. She will be uh, doing an evening event and also a morning school event. And also she's our 2023 Library of Congress Jazz Scholar. She's gonna be spending some time with our jazz collections and then she will write an article that will be posted on our blog next year. So Lakeisha, before <laughs> we came here, we spent some time looking at some material from our mm -hmm. collections. What, what is your reaction to what you saw that you can share with the audience? I think it's just amazing, like the fact when we saw the Love Supreme mm -hmm. uh, suite, I've never seen that actually written down. I've kind of learned from the records and, and got it from the old guys, but to actually see that lead sheet and see what he meant to write, to see Charles Mingus's music, to find out that he even had a, a song called Cumbia, you know, I grew up playing Latin <laughs> music, to just see the history, Jerry Mulligan's Grammy, mm -hmm. you know, we're in the Grammy season right now, it's a inspiring to know the people that have come before and what they've accomplished and what they left behind and to try to leave my own message. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was looking for some material for Lakeisha and I came across this, this piece from the Charles Mingus collection. It's called Cumbia Jazz Fusion. And I was so inspired to show it to Lakeisha because she has a salsa merengue background uh, that I would love her to yeah. share with us. I mean, I started out playing mostly in Washington Heights. Mm -hmm. So my first ever interaction with any type of music was playing uh, Haleos. And that's like a, for those that don't know, it's kind of like a, a saxophone riff and mm -hmm. kind of design that's gone into the mambos of like merengue music. So an example, and it's your job to kind of play that and arpeggiate the whole time. So to come from that background, my whole experience is keeping people on the dance floor, keeping parties going. And that's what really, I guess, founded the core of who I am as I've moved through the genres, to then see that the first jazz musician, Charles Mingus, I ever heard in my life has a piece called Cumbia. And that's like where I, a heartfelt thing to me. Mm -hmm. Just let me know that, you know, I'm on the right path and just that we share a similarity in that too. Mm -hmm. So from your time playing merengue, and particularly merengue, because that, the pace is so fast, yeah. and you have to be like playing for long periods of time, would you say that also like trained you in a way for the path that you will take later on? Absolutely, especially with like a lot of the co-trained music I have. Uh -huh. My band is always telling me, you're playing way too fast, slow it down, <laughs> it's too hard for us. And I'm like, you gotta get with Washington Heights, man. <laughs> this is the pace. <laughs> Um, I know that you have such reach and as we were talking before, you're a hassler. You, you've been doing so many things from a very young age. Mm -hmm. You're always pushing um, your music forward, connecting with people. And you have some great stories in, in your background. One of them is a story about uh, Clark Terry. Oh, yeah. Can you share that with us? Uh, Clark Terry was the, the first musician I ever got called for, like my, I guess my first big break gig. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting at home practicing in my grandmother's apartment. And we had no AC, so it's about 98 degrees. I'm sweating everywhere. And she hands me the phone and says, there's a man on the phone for you. I pick it up, and he's like, hey, this is uh, Clark Terry. So I just hung it up. I was like, look, this cannot be real. <laughs> I thought it was somebody playing with me, and I'm practicing. He called back. He said, don't ever hang the phone up on me again. And I said, OK, this is the real Clark Terry? He said, yeah. I said, OK, what can I do for you, Mr. Terry? He said, I'm starting a band full of young people, and I want you to be a part of the band, but you need to audition. He asked me, do you know where New Jersey is? I said, I have no idea where New Jersey is. He says, okay, take this address down. So I wrote it down. He said, you have one hour to get here and come to the audition. Mm -hmm. So I'm calling every gypsy cab I can. Mm -hmm. Can you take me to New Jersey, New Jersey, New Jersey? And I'm trying to find the money to get together to go. Eventually, long story short, I get there, go to his house. His wife opens the door and says, oh, Lakeisha, he's in the basement. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, ma'am, I don't go into the basement. He said, <laughs> you're going into the basement today. I said, I don't go into the basement with, with adults. She said, He's in the basement. Let me know when you get down there. So I go down there kind of scared, holding my sacks almost like a bat. Because mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm going to, you know, I guess <laughs> bash Clark Terry in the head if he jumps out. <laughs> so that's like the worst thing ever you could do. But I get down there. He sees me. He says, oh, girl, come sit down. What are you doing? I said, I don't know. So I sat down. And he had a music stand right there, a song called Etoile, y'all. And he said, I want you to play that song. I said, you just want me to set up and play this? He said, yeah. So I set up. And I was about to play. And then something stopped me. And I said, 
you going to count me off? He said, good idea. And out of nowhere, this man had the most energetic count. I won, I do, I won, I do. I was, as I jumped back, like, whoa. So I played, like, you know, maybe the first four bars. He stopped. He said, stop, stop, stop. You're hired. I said, that's it? He said, you want there to be more? I said, no. Let's that, stop it right there. He said, okay, cool. He took the music away, took out his trumpet, and started just playing a song. I knew the song, so I was like, I started playing, like, a bass line to it. And we went back soloing and playing together for the next two and a half hours, maybe. Then he started after that telling me about his life in St. Louis, playing on the holes, and how he got into the music. And it was like the most life-changing five hours of my life, <laughs> just from that experience. And from that day on, I was now a member of the Clark Terry Band. <laughs> That's an amazing story. It I was great. I hearing about it. <laughs> yeah. So tell me, by the time that you do your first album, Retox, mm -hmm. you have already broken into the music industry, you were playing with big names, you were touring around the globe. What makes you take that step to say, this is my time, I'm going to do my own music? I feel that when you play with somebody else, my whole purpose and goal, if I'm playing with Stevie Wonder, how do I make Stevie Wonder's music sound best? What is his vision? If he wants to spread love, how can I play to spread love? Everything you do is to enhance the vision of the artist you're playing with so that that can be communicated to the audience. When I got to a place that I find myself in my solos playing things that oh, I want to play, like, oh, I, I, I want to play this a little differently. He don't want to hear a free jazz solo on his show, mm -hmm. but I'm starting to hear that. So I'm having a hard time doing what's professional and right in myself, and that let me know I need an outlet in a place. to There's something bursting out inside of me that I cannot get out. So I need to walk away and get this out the way. And even if I'm doing this on the side, I can be true to the shows that I'm playing. So that's how I started. I said, there's just too much desire in me, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And from that moment, you have, you recorded two, your first two studio albums, Retox, and then you had your second album. Mm -hmm. That year was 2018. 2018. And then you go into 2020 with Pursuance. Mm -hmm. What was the, I feel like your first, your first two albums are like one part of your journey. Totally. <laughs> and then you move into a different, not different direction, but you move into another, like another room in the same house. You know, even though I had extensive work with Clark and Rashid Ali and Chris, all these other people, Gregory Porter, and so I was mm -hmm. deep into jazz. At the time, I was playing with such big pop stars and mm -hmm. everything. Like that's the music that I'm, I'm writing, I'm creating, I'm, I'm in that energy. And then in, in 2018, my sister passed away. And I had, did rise up as a dedication to her. And then, you know, I had realized from 2012 to 2018, my whole life has been like, everybody put your hands together, get on the dance floor. Mm -hmm. And I felt like there's just something deeper mm -hmm. that I need to spend some time getting to because I've spent all of this time, you know, with the kind of life of the party vibe. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's nothing wrong with that. That's a part of me. But there's some deeper harmony, deeper expression, deeper music that I'm trying to get to, and I'm actually trying to get my plane to a higher level. Mm -hmm. So I, feel like I, I felt like I needed to go back a little bit and rediscover why I wanted to play and get that, that hunger back in me in terms of every day practicing nonstop, every day looking for the new answers, looking for kind of reinventing myself. Mm -hmm. I was like, I've, I've done what I've came to do, and I'm stagnant. So I need to rebrand and reinvent where I'm going in life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How was that experience with your second album? Did you achieve your goal? Uh, in a way, yes. I mean, I, I was looking to, to pay tribute to my sister, you know, so that, that, was, that was the only goal I had. You know, I wasn't thinking like, you know, I never do albums thinking, oh, I want to be in Downbeat, or I want to win a Grammy. I always think I'm expressing what the reality of my life and the planet. Mm -hmm. So I felt like, yeah, I got that out. But then at the end of it, I did feel a little empty. Mm. I felt like, you know, if I was to die today, would the whole world know everything about me? Mm. They would only have these two albums that reflect a little piece of me, and the story's kind of untold. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to start documenting, I guess, kind of leaving back a legacy. Mm -hmm. Like every time I do an album now, I wanted to show a different side of myself, different parts of humanity, different parts, so that another generation come along and look at a, a, a long body of work mm -hmm. and really see documented who I am and not have to hear the stories of, oh, you know, she knew cumbia, mm -hmm. she knew funk, she knew jazz. I want to put it down 
for the history books. Mm -hmm, <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. What was the, the, your spirit coming into um, your third album, Pursuance? You had, you're moving into another room in the same house. You want to go deeper into your own writing. Mm -hmm. And you have these two huge heroes. And it's a, it's a big program, a big, <laughs> yeah. a big task yeah. to tackle. Uh, how, what was your spirit uh, entering into that project? Well, I started with John Coltrane and Alice Coltrane because those were the people that kept me in jazz and mm -hmm. kept me focused. So I consider them, out of all the jazz musicians, the highest talent level. Mm -hmm. Like they've reached a level of, of musicality that everyone strives to. But, and, and also in correlation with that, the level they have for the love of humanity, mm -hmm. for peace, mm -hmm. for spreading joy, mm -hmm. for spreading knowledge and information is equally at that level. Mm -hmm. So those are kind of things that I'm looking to do in my music and in my life, the kind of person I want to be. Mm -hmm. So I said, if I start with them, I can get back to who I really am. And not to mention, this music is going to really, really challenge me. So it, it just felt like this is the best way to kind of reopen a new door and start a whole new journey. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting that you said that because that's how I felt by getting ready to meet you and by going through the music. Oh. <laughs> I felt that you have a very strong connection, not only musically, yeah. but in terms of um, values and the way that you look at life comparable to uh, John and Alice Coltrane. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the whole message and, and I guess design of my music is to bring people together. Mm -hmm. I'm, of course, I'm looking for healing and to spread joy, but I'm looking to help people have an experience. Mm -hmm. When you come to see me, whatever experience you need, I'm, I'm trying to provide that. If you need a safe space, if you need a place to be sad, if you need a place to be happy, it's open for that. It's open for any type of healing. It's open for complete partying and breaking out. It's a kind of congregational experience. So that's what I'm looking for in my music. And at the same time that I'm spreading that musically, I'm trying to instill historically the tradition of the music into kind of, you know, you may not know if, let's say, you're just coming up, you're 15, who John and Alice Coltrane are. Mm -hmm. But so you look into the album and start researching them. Then you say, who is Ron Carter? He played with them. How old is he? Mm -hmm. And everybody on the album has played with each other and they've been mentored by each other. So I wanted to go through multiple generations mm -hmm. to just kind of give the... I guess the audience and the viewers in this phase in my life to show this is how music and not just jazz, all the music are mm -hmm. passed down mm -hmm. from the older people to the younger people and then those people become the older people. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to show that sonically mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that people understand like, you know, this is how we, this is how we roll. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. And moving to your 2023 release, Phoenix. So you have this huge moment with Pursuance. You have all these huge names, big projects, mm -hmm. super successful. How do you feel about entering this new project with your music, <laughs> your project, your music, these big names also? Yeah. Uh, Terry Lynn Carrington is the producer. Mm -hmm. How do you start this project? This project, uh, you know, after Pursuance, tons of people were asking me, what's next? Mm. So I felt even from a critic standpoint, whatever CD I release next, they are going to compare it mm. to Pursuance. So that happened, but I guess luckily and not luckily, I was in a very bad car accident. And that car accident, I almost nearly died. Mm -hmm. I fractured my ribs, my jaw, my scapula. I had a concussion, completely out of touch with reality. And I had to find a way to get myself back to health and get myself even the stamina to start playing again. So the reason I named it Phoenix is because for me, it feels like in each album I'm doing now, I'm in a way having to die and to be reborn. Mm. You know, it's this beautiful healing, you know, nostalgic bird, and it's always dying and coming back to be even better. So I felt with this project, since the, the whole goal of the guest was to help me introduce my music to the world, mm -hmm. because the coachings we had their music, and mm -hmm. now we're introducing my songs from people that I looked up to, so it just felt like a whole rebirth for everybody in the process. So it was really a remarkable experience to, when you do a project like that with people that not only have such amazing names and meaning to you, but they're a clear reflection of what you look like, mm. you know? So you're, you're actually looking in the mirror and seeing, oh, Terry Lynn, mm -hmm. you know, it's just somebody that she wasn't, even though she started playing that three-year-old with tons of legends, she's had to work work, work to get the name she mm -hmm. has. Mm 
and it didn't come so easy. People weren't so accepting. So if she can plow through as a woman in jazz and get to a place where she is revered, then I should strap on my boots and get ready because, you know, these are perfect examples of never giving up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the, I admire that so much on you. You are such a hard worker, oh. dedicated, <laughs> um, persistent artist. Yeah. Because you can be talented. You can be as talented as you want to be. But if you are not, if you are not dedicated, hardworking, um, persistent, consistent, and hustler, mm -hmm. it's very difficult in this, in this environment to get to where you are. And so I'm curious to, to know what, what would be your recommendation when you talk to your students? I know you are also an educator. Yeah. What do you say to them in this, in this environment where we have so many distractions? And yeah, I mean, it's hard to like put into words like what personality you need, but it's almost an unbreakable, unshakable determination. Mm -hmm. Like even if someone told me, hey, you know, by the time you're 80 years old, you'll never be a good saxophone player. And even someone gives you that odd, you say, let's see. Mm -hmm. And you keep pressing and you keep practicing every day. And you say, okay, this guy's practicing two hours a day. I'm going to practice 14 hours mm -hmm. a day. You know, almost like a Kobe Bryant mentality mm -hmm. that I'm never going to give up. I'm never going to stop. I'm going to work harder than you. I'm going to try harder than you. And I'm going to enjoy doing it more than you. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that process of knowing takes a lot of fear out of it for me, me knowing that until the last day I'm here, I'm never going to stop, you know? So, okay, I want Angela Davis on the CD. If she's not going to do it, okay, I'll see you in 2024. Mm -hmm. I'll be there again. I'll see you in 2025. Okay, we never make it. Because if you don't learn to create opportunities for yourself, you don't know how far you can go. Mm -hmm. You're always sitting by the phone waiting for someone to call you and hoping maybe one day Stevie Wonder will call me. Mm -hmm. He doesn't even know you're there. Or maybe he'll see me on Instagram. Or maybe you show up at his house. We was the worst thing happen. You get arrested. Then you have a great story. You know? I always tell my students, go ahead, I'll bail you out. Just call me up. <laughs> I'll get you out of there. You know, try not to do anything too crazy. But you know, when you're a little a little girl, a little boy, you've always taught, what are your dreams? I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a teacher. I, I want to be an anthropologist. And slowly as life comes at you, People start teaching you backup careers. What else could you do? If this doesn't work out, you got to have a B plan. They start putting, even though it may not happen to you, they're sowing the doubt in you. They think they're arming you with all the ammo you need to live a perfect life. But what they're slowly telling you is, you're a little too old for this. Mm -hmm. You need to come back to reality. Oh, you think you're going to be married by 23? Now you're 33. They're slowly giving you reality. Mm -hmm. And the, the history is made by the people that dream big. Mm -hmm. It's not made by reality, you know? Wow, I feel like completely powered up. <laughs> <She's> a <laughs> motivational I, tape. I am ready to go. Hey. I remember I interviewed Chucho Valdez back in 2019. Mm. And he said something similar to you and that I, till this day, I keep it here. He said, you can be talented, but if you are not willing to work, To develop that talent, there's nothing you can do. The hard worker passes the talented person. Exactly. Because you, I'm born with a certain amount of talent. I'm a prodigy. Mm -hmm. You ever notice somebody's a prodigy at five years old, and at 25, they're playing the same? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you know, think, you're thinking, wow, what are they going to be when they're this age? But they're staying the same. Right. Because they don't have to work as hard. Right. They don't have to get better. Every, their whole life, people are saying, wow, you're amazing. But the kid that their whole life, people are saying, eh. That don't sound so good. Mm -hmm. Are you going to be able to come to the Library of Congress? You're just from Washington Heights. Mm -hmm. Why are they going to write you down there? Who are you? Mm -hmm. That kid is thinking, even now that I'm here with you guys in this wonderful place, my mind is already thinking, I never thought I'd be in a place like this. Mm -hmm. Where else can I go? Mm -hmm. You know, where the person that's born in the situation is thinking, oh, this is normal. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go to bed tonight. I'm going to be up all night listening to cumbia. <laughs> you know, so it's a, it's a, it's a different mentality to to have a sense of gratitude that you're getting to do what you love every day and to not take it for granted. Mm -hmm. At any moment, it can go away. So you have to work hard, but you have to be filled with joy that what you're doing. Like, this is amazing 
that I'm getting to see this work here. I'm getting to meet you for the first time. These are opportunities that other people are dreaming about mm -hmm. and you're taking it for granted. There's some little kid right now sitting, waiting for an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And if I'm squandering it, I tell my students now, okay, you 12. In 10 years, we have the same job we're applying for. Mm -hmm. So am I gonna stand in your way or am I gonna allow you to take the job? You know, so am I here to help? Am I here to inspire? Or am I here to discourage? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everything I'm doing right now is so that we're not in competition. I want you to be better. I'm giving you all the tools to make you better than me. Not so that when you get to this age, I can say, oh, I still, I'm still playing better than you. If I'm, still, if, you if, I'm, if I'm still playing better than you, I'm not a great teacher. Why are you not better yet? <laughs> so, you know, so I just think we need a spirit more of giving and joy about that. Mm -hmm. when you, if you're doing something, if 20 years from now I come back and you're the president, I should be excited. Mm. Not like, what, what happened in my life? <laughs> how come she's the president and I'm not? That's how people always think about themselves <laughs> right, next. You right, know, like, right. why am I not this? And <laughs> instead of just saying, look how far Claudia's come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember we were talking about this and now she's going for that. Mm. Maybe I should get up and try to do something instead of saying, why are you there? <laughs> right, look at your own experience. Yeah. And I, I hear <laughs> you saying Cumbia multiple times. I, I, I see like a theme going on. <laughs> <laughs> the next album, Cumbia. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna be looking out for the next Lakeisha, Benjamins. It's totally possible. I made a joke about that. I said, next year I'm gonna be in the Latin jazz category. <laughs> but I was just totally joking. <laughs> so Lakeisha, before we go, as I said earlier, you are here for the 2023 Library of Congress Jazz Scholar. Mm -hmm. You're going to be writing something for us next year. Do you have mm -hmm. an idea what you're interested in at this moment? Yeah, I'm hoping to write something that is reflective of my generation, our mm -hmm. experience, but also society's experience right now. Like we're all coming out of the pandemic, but we're also somewhat in the pandemic. There's all kinds of social like, issues going on all the world and we're all striving for peace and freedom and love and the ability to go back to living how we used to live. So I'm looking for something that can, can just be a statement for, right now this is a snapshot of where my generation is mm -hmm. and what we're thinking about and what we're hoping for. And this is where the world is. And you know, provide some type of motivation to like, let's make 2024 better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So everyone watching from home, Lakeisha Benjamin, Library of Congress, tomorrow night, check us out.